Hello, welcome to Values, Virtues, Ethics and Morality. This is a subject that is of interest to us in the studio today. And to that end, I welcome Sister Denise, who has been practicing Raj Yoga meditation with the Brahma Kumaris for over 40 years. My name is Magla Pillay, and it's my pleasure to be interviewing Sister Denise today. The um, background will tell you that we are approaching this dialogue using something called the Socratic method, and that is a way of eliciting answers from somebody by putting questions uh, to them, uh, the aim of which is to arrive at a universal truth. Um, the aim of today's program and all other episodes on this series is to re-look at conventional values, to question, to analyze, to dialogue, and to uh, look at um, attitudes that we have taken for granted and to ask the question, is the way we think and the way we've been functioning up until now working for us? Uh, Sister Denise, thank you very much for joining us in the studio today and a very, very warm welcome. Thank you, Magla. Thank you. So uh, Thank you. the topic today is um, not light by any standards. It's extremism and fundamentalism. Uh, a lot of what we see in today's world, which causes uh, not a small amount of uh, uh, worry, fear and terror in the hearts of people across the globe. Uh, could you define these terms for somebody who has no idea what they mean? In a way, fundamentalism, if you look at the original meaning of it, it means to go back to the foundations. Except that somebody who's a fundamentalist isn't really doing that. Uh, extremism is much more of a accurate expression because extremism means that you're taking a section of a particular belief system out of context and without reference to the rest of it and you are saying that that is the whole thing and giving yourself the right to behave according to that in the name of the whole thing. And this then becomes a very big problem. So what I think we need to do is um, bear in mind that any kind of system of thought, uh, religious tradition, uh, really covers a very wide spectrum. And in order for it to persist over thousands of years, it has to be balanced. In order for it to be spiritually uh, powerful and sustaining, it has to be balanced. And so just the word extreme means that you're not balanced. So, for example, um, we have extremists uh, who uh, are very pro one gender and very against another gender. That's one kind of extremism. The totality of the human race is two genders and talk about their value has to be balanced. If you say one has value and the other one doesn't, then it loses truth, you see. So when a tradition or a spiritual system or a religion is put forward, then it has to encompass a very broad spectrum. It has to be balanced, otherwise it becomes anti-human. And so this is the problem that we're dealing with these days. People who espouse extremist positions do not know about critical thinking. 
they do not know how to critique the um, the attitudes that they have. They do not know how to look at where they came from, how they're operating, and what they're going to lead to. And so this is why we have um, uh, extremism as one of the great difficulties that we are facing in the world today. And I think that what we're going through historically is an extreme period. So that for there to be a lot of extremism and fundamental uh, ideas in such a period is um, something that you can expect. But then the question is, how do you deal with the question of passing through an extreme period where there is a lot of extremism going on? Mm. Um, tell us more about critical thinking. What does it entail? And how does one become a critical thinker if you're not? Um, are you saying that people just accept whatever is uh, uh, whatever they've been exposed to? You know this word propaganda. Propaganda is when you take a premise and then you um, you say that is the truth, which it may or may not be, because you don't subject it to any tests. Then you add another truth, which may or may not be a logical next step, but you put them together in juxtaposition, then you arrive at a conclusion which is uh, arrived at through faulty logic. But if a person doesn't know how to evaluate and set certain sentences against a set of criteria to determine whether it's valid or not, uh, then you will arrive at incorrect conclusions which you will not realize are incorrect. You then base your life on those and you do action which is extremely harmful and negative and therefore you are severely violating all the laws of karma. Mm. So uh, for a person to be a critical thinker, they need a very good education an education what? and system of thinking. So it's, it's not conventional education that you're referring to. It's on how to think. How to think. Okay, so how do you think? How do I think? Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, if somebody says something, like you present me with questions, and then I will see, okay, are they valid? Do they fit certain criteria? Are they logical? Are they consistent? Are they coherent? You see? So if I start with a statement that says, you know, uh, all um, people of a certain religion hate God, I'm making a sweeping generalization. And somebody may is needed to come along and say, okay, can you substantiate that claim? And they need to be able to substantiate it. But if nobody comes along to challenge that and say, you must substantiate that claim, because that is a sweeping generalization. And any generalization is unlikely to be true, because there's always going to be some people who do not fit that sweeping generalization statement. So in critical thinking, you would know in advance that making a sweeping generalization is anyway going to be false. So you have to discipline yourself to not do that. Mm. You could say some people of some religions may be not having love for God, but then it's none of your business. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sister Denise, how does one end up becoming um, somebody whose values are extreme, whose mindset is extreme? Um, why is it that people trust the source? Or do they trust the source? Because at some, the way I see it, at some point in their lives, somebody fed them an idea. 
and then they bought this idea and now giving life to this idea and now acting on it and and so doing well harming themselves and others why do they trust the source to begin with mostly it is because of sort of indoctrination indoctrination means that you subject a person to a set of ideas relentlessly from a very young age when they're very vulnerable and they assume that what you're saying is true and great and so on and this is why i have an issue with what i call the external moral authorities because a young person believes inherently that what their parents tell them is true and they then go to school who their parents say here's your teacher he's going to educate you he's going to be telling you the truth and then they examine the child and if you don't give the right answer fail bad person bad pupil you know so you get a lot of rewards for accepting these ideas that may or may not be valid and a lot of punishment if you challenge them and so a person is pretty much brutalized into it and um it is so widespread that i don't think you can easily uh find an antidote to it but i think that when a person is an adult and they start to experience things in their lives that do not substantiate the things that they have believed which happens when they have exposure to the wider world where they are out of that um indoctrinating sort of environment uh then they will say wait a minute you know there's something wrong here i need to really refigure this and i think also it's part of the process of growing up that when a person is in their teenage years a sort of um some sort of machinery starts happening which says wait a minute i just need to question everything and they become very often rebels which is actually extremely healthy because they're saying now wait a minute i need to see for myself whether what i've been learning all these years is true and so you set everything against maybe new criteria that you learn and then you have to really reevaluate your uh, views and see that as an adult person you you come into adulthood after your teenage years where you're partly a child and partly an adult and it's a difficult time to make that transition but um having exposure to some of the things like we're talking about if a person has never heard such things before well hopefully it'll set them thinking mm. you see because uh, sowing seeds of doubt in this sort of way the socratic way that we're using is very healthy and sowing seeds of doubt is not necessarily by definition a bad thing mm. you need to have healthy doubt until you satisfy yourself that yes these beliefs that i hold these views that i have are coherent they are valid they make sense and they are consistent with my experience of reality Uh where does the human conscience fit into this scenario of extremism and uh fundamentalism? I feel that human conscience has has a very important part to play in it. Because very often extremism takes you into violence and conscience will react against violence. there are people who are forced into violence and they're forced to kill their conscience but something sooner or later happens where it wakes up again and you see something or you have to do something or you experience something and you say this is not right and that sets you thinking you see mm uh earlier you mentioned a balanced um existence balanced life or balanced way of thinking um that um 
sits very well with me. Could you share more about that? And more specifically, uh, if you find yourself, if an individual finds himself in a position of going towards fundamentalism or extremism, um, how do they bring themselves back into a more balanced way of being? Probably the important thing is to be in a context of the wider world that's as wide as possible so that you have um, experience of people who have a lot of different ideas from you, different ideas from those who you have heard from, so that you can really see that there is a lot of stuff out there. And then you need to see the different sides of your life. You know, they, there's a saying, you know, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, and all play and no work, that's also out of balance. So there are many little sayings like this that say, you know, you need adequate sleep, you need stimulation, you need exercise, you need relaxation, you need all the things in order to be a balanced person. And a person who's out of balance is um, going to be sick, you see, mentally, physically, socially, or whatever, you see. So, so balance means all the different aspects of your life, your relationships, your food. If you eat only one kind of food all the time, your body's going to really react against it. The body needs variety. The soul needs variety. You need lots of different kinds of friends, lots of different environments in order to really be right. You see, mm. and I think your conscience helps you to get a sense when things are right and when things are not right, you feel inside, no, I shouldn't be doing this. I really need to balance this out. Sometimes you will override that, but even when you do that, you will know that you're not doing something right and you excuse it, say, well, just this once I have to work extra hard or this or that. So if it's temporary, then it's okay. But if you keep on doing something that takes you out of balance, you will pay for it with your health problem, financial problem, relationship problem. There will be something that goes wrong in your life uh, to alert you to the fact that the way that you're living is not right. Hmm. Um, I believe that somebody will only return to a particular form of behavior if they're getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. So what does an extremist get out of his um, conduct or attitude and the same thing for a fundamentalist what what is the reward because um, for those of us on the outside looking in you scratch your head and think excuse me okay but to them it means something uh, what what does it mean when you're fundamentalist you're in a restricted environment where everybody else is also fundamentalist and so it, within that restricted environment, they get, um, you know, feedback, positive feedback for something that's negative, And that gives them a high, you see. As soon as they come out of that environment, they're not going to get that positive feedback. So they don't feel comfortable. So they stay within that environment. And that is really the problem, this sort of exclusiveness of it. It is unhealthy. Mm. Um. See, interesting in Brahma Kumaris, um, everyone who's studying Raj Yoga, they uh, have to go to work and come to the center, go home, come to the center, go off on their holiday, come back to their studies. Um, do various different things, which is nothing to do with Raj Yoga, and then come back into Raj Yoga. So there's all the time a connection with the w wider world, which keeps the soul in perspective, which is good, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the law of karma um, and uh, fundamentalism and extremism, could you connect those dots for us, please? I think so, yeah. Extremism, as I mentioned earlier, will push you towards extreme behaviors, one of which is violence, mm -hmm. another of which is you kind of threaten people with magical thinking. Uh, you say, you know, that if you 
don't follow this thing, you know, the sky's going to fall on your head, and you get people to go into a sort of superstitious mentality, and sooner or later there's going to be something going really wildly wrong, uh, and some kind of suffering, some kind of weirdness happening, which will alert you that, hey, there's something wrong here. Um, my very limited experience of the fundamentalists that I knew um, was that their belief is that their way is the only way. Mm -hmm. Now, I said, but what about this person in this country, that person in that country? Are they all wrong? And you're right. The answer was yes, of course. Mm. Now, what makes a person so short-sighted? Well, well, there's a lot of positive reinforcement for, or we could say positive or negative reinforcement for this fundamentalist um, world view, you see. And um, so they buy into it, and it operates really like a superstition, magical thinking it's called. Mm. So, Sister Denise, is the world one day going to be taken over by extremists and fundamentalists? Because the, re the reason I'm asking is because now they po seem to pop up everywhere. And um, the behavior causes such shock to the rest of the world who think, I mean, excuse me, what happened to you? How did you get here? Uh, how real is the existence a threat to humanity? My feeling is that there is a kind of deep down vibration of harmony in the world and something can go against it only to a certain point it cannot take it over totally there will always be pockets saying excuse me this is not okay you know so no it cannot totally take over humanity it can have a good try which it's doing but no, um, I, I firmly believe in this fundamental harmony that, you know, there will be people always who will see clearly that, you know, that is not right. Mm. And then from the point of view of the law of karma, which you mentioned earlier, it also won't allow the totality of negativity to take over completely. Uh, so that there is nothing positive left. An interesting symbol of it is the yin-yang symbol, mm. where, you know, in the dark there's a little bit of light, in the light there's a little bit of dark. And I think that that is quite, um, quite realistic about the, the balance of the universe, if you will. So, Denise, will the extremists and fundamentalists succeed in their ideology? If you look historically at things that have happened in the world where there's been resistance to something taking over that is negative, uh, take the apartheid uh, system of South Africa, there was resistance at great cost, at, with great difficulty, until eventually that system came down. I think that it is part of the nature of humanity that there will be resistance to slavery, there's resistance to um, the disempowerment of women, uh, resistance to human traf trafficking, resistance to the flesh trade, resistance to the arms trade, all of these things where there's enough people who are connected with their conscience who say, no, this is not okay, even if it reaches very powerful dimensions, but ultimately it cannot. Um, and in fact, there's a spiritual law that says that it is not possible to take over the world uh, through a mechanism of violence. Mm. You can take over the world through the mechanism of love. That is there but not through the mechanism of violence. Okay. Uh, one last question I have for you is that the response to extremism and fundamentalism is to send in drones 
and um, try to obliterate the extremists. But does killing the extremists um, obliterate that particular sector? Because what they're trying to get rid of, I think, is the mindset. They're killing the people who hold the mindset. Is that an answer? I don't it think... It seems such an odd... Uh, I can understand why they're doing it. It just seems odd. Yes, I, I don't think, from, from a karmic point of view, I don't think it can possibly succeed. But I think they probably don't find any other way. Um, and so they're doing it that way. But eventually, negativity destroys itself when it reaches sufficient proportions, you know. So if you fight fire with fire, eventually it'll all be burned out and there'll be no more fire and no more forest to burn. But then comes a regeneration where the buried seeds, you know, when the fire is out, they start coming out again. And I think we might be looking at something like that. Mm. Mm. Okay, unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for today. And um, uh, this subject uh, was of interest to us, and that's why we chose to take it up. And Sister Denise has shared some um, extremely profound ideas and thoughts on um, why extremism and fundamentalism exists, because I'm sure it's a question in your mind as well. It certainly is in mine as to why there are pockets of people who conduct themselves in such a manner that the rest of us find incomprehensible. And uh, because the world is so varied, Sister Denise has shared that, uh, believe it or not, there's place for them too. And uh, what I found most profound is that Sister Denise shared towards the end that the law of karma will not allow the world to become totally bad. I must say, Sister Denise, when you said that, I felt uh, I heaved a silent sigh of relief <laughs> because um, uh, there are those of us who fear that uh, it's all going down south very fast and there, there is, we've reached the point of no return. So there is a hope um, and there is no reason to fear that's the best message I got from today's talk is that there's no re reason to fear because uh, there's safety to be found within spirituality despite extremism and fundamentalism existing in today's world uh, I hope you found this talk stimulating as I have and we wish to thank Sister Denise for what she shared with us today thank you and goodbye Thank you.